Hello, I'm Sokam, welcome back to the second channel video. So it's no secret that I'm from the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and as a result of that, I've made a few videos talking about the political situation over here and kind of breaking it down for those of you who are curious, and a lot of people enjoyed those breakdowns, it does seem, because a few Americans even watched those videos and said, hey, why don't you cover the US election happening this year? And I figured, why not do that? Given that it's the biggest election, not only in the US, but also in the world happening this year, and it's going to determine who is arguably the most powerful person in the entire world, why not talk about what exactly is going down with the US election, in my opinion, because although most Europeans and most people from most countries, all of the ones in red, where the US leadership's opinion has gone down significantly, will just say that, yeah, Donald Trump is not a very popular guy, he's clearly going to lose in 2020, it was a fluke that he got in in 2016, and you can back that up by looking at, like, say, approvability uh, polls, where most people disapprove of Donald Trump and have done for a very long time, you can look at these two pieces of evidence together and say, yeah, well, whatever blue guy runs in 2020 will definitely beat Donald Trump, it's a guaranteed thing, but I think it's actually a little bit more complex than that because let's be honest, the world doesn't decide the US leader, even though it's a bad thing for them to alienate their allies, it's not what determines who becomes president, even though it's a bad thing to not be favourable with most of the population that's not what determines who will be the president in 2020, because instead what decides it is this map right here. It's a map you'll see a lot when campaigning season happens, and it's an interesting map because it basically you know, says that most of these states and most of the electoral votes in 2020 are already decided, because the interesting thing about the US is unlike most countries, they actually use a system uh, that is based on, again, it's kind of like election districts, but it basically means that having the most votes is not what wins you a election. In fact, in 2016, the blue woman actually got more votes than the red guy, as you can see right here, but that's not what uh, actually matters. What matters is getting the most states. As you can see, um, tr Trump, the, the, the red candidate, won most of these states in 2016, and as a result of that, he got the highest electoral vote, and as a result of that, he is now president. So to win in 2020, you need to get most of these states, or rather, you need to get the most of these number from these states uh, to be on your side. You can win the electoral vote with surprisingly few states, but basically you need to have the majority of people slash states, a kind of weird hybrid of the two, on your side if you'd like to win. And um, yeah, that's interesting because it means that even though you can get the most votes, if you pile up those states uh, votes in states you already uh, you know have, then it doesn't go so well. And so this map becomes very important because it basically uh, you know insists that this is something that's true in most elections, uh, unless there's huge upsets, most people will vote for the same candidate they voted for last time in the next election. For whatever reason you want to call that, whether it's laziness or whether it's just because parties already represent the values and the candidate's kind of secondary, most people will vote for the same people they voted for last election in this particular election, with only 10 to 20% of voters actually up for grabs, and in reality only 5 to 6, 7% actually end up changing their minds uh, in most uh, effective campaigns, and therefore this map gets drawn, which shows how many states are most likely leaning blue versus how many states lean red. And when you look at this map, you can see how the blue party has actually a significant advantage and always usually does actually in terms of the pure numbers. If you coin flip all of the other states, you would end up most of the time with a blue majority. Um, however, there's an interesting kind of double-edged sword in this that even though the uh, the blue party has like a 32 electoral vote lead and they're like most of the way there already, there's the kind of thing where like even though the they have more states, they have more states less solidly. So to simplify this, let's look at the red states and be like, oh yeah, all of the red states across the board, this kind of diagonal scar across the US, you can see how like all of these states are solidly red with only really two or three states that are like kind of not so deeply there and they're states that you probably imagine as being super red like the Texases of the world which are won by less than 10% or the Georgias of the world won by less than 5%. Most of their states are solidly red whereas most of the blue states, um, again they have the Californias or the West Coast let's just call it, which are won by huge margins of like 30% in California and Hawaii. We have the New Yorks of the world, the Illinois of the world, the Massachusetts, which are won by absolutely ridiculous majorities, but then there's a lot of states which are much lighter blue. The Colorados, New Mexico's, Nevada's, Virginia's, uh, now Minnesota, surprisingly, is of the world, which, it, the fact that this is a now almost swing state is insane. It was won by just 1% in uh, 2016. Even though it's the state which has voted blue the longest, that could easily change. So they have a lot of states which they need to hold on to, as well as grabbing these other states, where, yeah, the, the Floridas of the world, everyone knows you go for Florida, right? Even the Purge knows that you go for Florida first. Um, the Floridas of the world, the North Carolinas, the Pennsylvanias, these states flip hands very, very often, and they're the ones that realistically will determine who wins. So, um, yeah, in case you want to see this in like a list form, because it's kind of interesting that way too, um, here's the kind of percentages that each state won by. Again, you can see, looking at the actual percentages over here on the right, you can see how like, oh yeah, New Hampshire was the smallest win for the blue, but the thing that really led, um, you know, Donald Trump to get in power, despite the fact that polls uh, led up wise, is very, very small margins against polling, again, 
polling can't be precise down to 0.23%, uh, led to wins in Michigan, a state that they were never expected to win, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Florida, all won by super, super, super thin majorities, which means all you need to do to get, again, these states, let's, let's say you want to have these states in blue, uh, all you need to do is flip 1% of people in here, 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 oh, wait, uh, sorry, I think it was... Um, Michigan over, over here. Uh, once you flip those states, already you can see how that's 312. And uh, what's that? It looks like the, the blue party has won. Except that's where the challenge in this election actually is. Again, uh, you can put the challenge down to whatever you really want to call it. Let's uh, throw the back end toss up. You can, you can put the challenge down to whatever you want to call it. But really, it comes down to getting voters in these states to vote for you over the other person. So what's the deal with that? Which party is most likely to have their voters uh, you know, or get these voters to flip sides, as well as keeping their voters on side in the kind of marginal states, which matters way less for red than it does for blue. So let's talk exactly about that one, because the most likely candidate for red, it, it goes without saying, is probably going to be Donald Trump. Because most people, when they think of primaries, they think of the Democratic primary. There's five candidates here, plus there's ugly a sixth one in the form of Bloomberg. There's like six major-ish candidates who might become a uh, president for the uh, presidential candidate for the blue person. Um, but on the red side, there actually is primaries happening as well. It's just not very common to run uh, a guy against the president, although the libertarian former vice president, Bill Weld, is apparently doing that and got 9% of the vote, so good for him, I guess. But yeah, there are primaries happening right now, and realistically speaking, Donald Trump will be the nominee for the red, and realistically speaking, one of like, uh, again, like three or four people here, um, I'd say realistically it's going to be Pete or Bernie or uh, Joe Biden or Bloomberg. It's going to be one of those guys um, that ends up winning, um, although it could be one of these two of people, it remains to be seen. Uh, one of those people is going to be the person who faces up against Donald Trump, and therefore the question becomes, how well can these people, again, like, this this contest right here is actually going to determine how this contest goes, because you need to get a candidate in this contest who can win in the key states over in this one. And that's why I find this to be so interesting, because if you are really, really deep in the, uh, the red party media, or you're really, really deep in the blue party media, which is sadly, like, lots of the internet, like Twitter and Reddit these days. But um, if you're really, really deep in the media, you might believe that you need super more left or more right policies. You know what? Why don't we extra ban um, abortions and gay marriage? Or why don't we, uh, you know, force you to gay marry your cat? I'm just trying to come up with a ridiculous example. Uh, would, it, would it be gay marriage? I guess it'd be interspecies. Although, if it's a male cat. Uh, you know, but, it, but like, and my point is, is the super aggressive policies coming out of nowhere actually do win more votes, but they win more votes in states that are already hugely progressive. This is why, um, you know, popular people, uh, party figures on the blue side or the red side, they exist in states that are really, really deeply conservative or really, really deeply liberal. Um, for instance, uh, Alexander Kosh Ocasio Cortez is from a district in New York with 67% uh, in her favor. The more, the, the, in fact, the only reason she won her district is because she successfully primaried. Um the person she was up against, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that, that yeah, again, the, the the reality is for people like her, the way, wait, uh, District 14, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for people like her, the way that you get more votes is you get more votes by being more liberal, more left than the people who are already in charge. But the truth is, if you want to have the president, if you want to have the majority of House seats and one day the majority of Senate seats, you have to get those people across the, the country. And that's something that just doesn't come up in media at all. The way th the media is there to talk to you about about how to get mad about how much the other side sucks. But the truth is, you need to be focusing on these states right here as a presidential candidate or as just someone who wants your side to win nationwide if you want to do that. And therefore, that comes down to the interesting question of which of these guys is best for that. Interestingly enough, I would usually say like, oh yeah, it's definitely going to be the relatively moderate um, centrist guy in Pete Buttigieg, right? Like he's from the Midwest, which again, Midwest, all of the, uh, are now the swing states and also a way to hold on to Minnesota, which is so dangerously close to falling. Like you hold on to Minnesota, you get the wish, uh, Wisconsin's, the Michigan's, the Ohio, you've won with those already. Again, the Democrats need very few of these swing states on side, and then it's just guaranteed just from those alone. Um, so that would be the easiest solution. You might say, again, I could see the argument that like, oh yeah, usually democratic socialism is going to be hugely unpopular. There's a lot of, um, you know, people nationwide who will be turned off by that because that's how further left and further right politics work. However, in these states where there are huge job losses, the economies are swinging downwards. I mean, Michigan, even if you're not a US viewer watching this video, you know that Michigan, Detroit, going through some bad times right now, right? Um, even in a country that's hugely prosperous, there are parts of that country not doing well, and that's when further left messages can win, especially uh, just ideas like universal basic income. These are the sorts of things that can do actually pretty well in those states. So you can make the argument for Bernie Sanders, which I 
would say in 2016 would be a questionable logic, but given the states they lost in 2016, maybe he's the guy. Um, or you could make the argument for a Joe Biden and be like, oh yeah, well, here's the deal. The Democrats have not won, the Blue Party have not won since 20, uh, since they had Obama in charge. And Obama, of course, got more minority voters to vote for him uh, than racist voters to vote against him. Because maybe you could argue that people who, let's not call it racist, I'm just trying to say people who really want a black person regardless of policies, people who really don't want a black person regardless of policies, there are more people who are going to vote for a black person regardless of policies than people who would vote against one regardless of that, or rather, who would switch side or resolve that. So, therefore, if you try to get that coalition together, the same people who voted for Obama, maybe the best guy is the vice presidential candidate from that guy, Joe, Bard uh, Joe Biden in this case. Um, you know, again, he does poll very well with those sorts of groups of people. Um, these are the questions you can ask. Again, you can maybe say like, oh yeah, if you run a woman, maybe you could get the woman vote up again and something, 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 although it didn't materialize in 2016. There are all these sorts of questions about the identities and the et cetera of these people, but what it really comes down to is how well can they campaign on the ideas that affect the people in these states? You've got to stop thinking about, again, it's important to remember the middle of the country exists, but you've got to stop thinking about the coastal liberal cities or about the wide majority of the center because those are not important when it comes to the president. How well the president or president candidate or <laughs> whoever else um, can appeal to these parts of the country right here. And then as always, Florida, the eternal swing state. And these days, um, you know, North Carolina, which was won by Obama in 2008 and then flipped to Romney in 2012, I'm not mistaken. Um, again, a, a, an interesting state that swung against the nationwide trend. Um, if these states that flip sides a lot, these are the ones that you need to get in your court. And that's all, that's again, I, and, and <laughs> therefore the question becomes, which candidate can do that best? If I if I was to give my opinion here at the end, because again, I, I feel like the actual question, also by the way, it's met, worth mentioning that right now, uh, even though um, again, the reason I mentioned the fifth place guy is being viable is because he's got the most um, endorsements from elected officials, which is actually very important in the Democratic primary process. But um, yeah, basically, uh, also Bloomberg is spending a lot of money, so he's arguably worth mentioning right there. But yeah, there's like kind of four or five or six different major candidates that all have their own benefits and downsides. But the key thing you need to focus on if you care about electability, if you care, yeah, if you care about electability is which guy can do the best here. Or if you really dislike the blue party and you want the red party to be in charge, you need a blue party guy who's really bad for those states. And again, usually that'd be easy to say. It'd be like, oh yeah, you go for the furthest left candidate and then you can attack them on socialism. That's how you stop, you know, again, the easiest way to stop, uh, you know, Texas going slowly pinker and purpler, I guess you could say, is like, oh yeah, get a super, get a guy who literally calls himself a socialist uh, in charge and that will stop, you know, these states fading to red. Um, and then also should help you win the Floridas and the Ohio's of the world. Um, but yeah, when it comes to this election, there's a lot at stake and uh, therefore, the traditional strategies of trying to get states to slowly switch over might change instead and go for a wild strategy of hammer the Rust Belt message home, hammer the message that like, yeah, these states would be better be better if they voted uh, red than if they voted blue. Um, that's the sort of thing we have to question here and how it will go is entirely down to US voters in 2020. But that's my take on things right now. It would, I, I personally, I think the real tragedy here is that the most likely candidate right now is Bernie Sanders. And regardless of what you think of him domestically, again, being called a democratic socialist is a fine policy in most parts of the world, probably not in large swaths of the US, but that's a whole thing. I think the real tragedy here is that most likely, uh, again, if we take, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the Bernie Sanders of the world, it's going to be two isolationist uh, US presidents who aren't big on foreign trade deals ruining, you know, good products for Americans. Like, again, Bernie Sanders is kind of anti-global trade, same with uh, Donald Trump. That'd be the tragedy of that one. The tragedy here, again, as a British person with Michael Bloomberg would be like, oh, so it's two New York mayors running against the new, sorry, two New York billionaires who have both switched parties more than twice, running against each other in a nationwide election where people believe there is no other choice, so they vote for them regardless of what they think there. Um, I think the the questionable tragedy of the other ones is like, the reality is, uh, what I'm trying to say right here, is the reality is, is as a British person from this election, I don't have much hope for my um, you know, my country side of this. But as far as like the political side, I'd, I'd say, you know what? It's going to be a very interesting, very close election regardless of what happens here. Because the interesting thing that 2016 proved is that regardless of how bad um, 
the candidate is on either side, people will still vote for whichever candidate they like or dislike because of just how much they dislike the other candidate. With record high third party votes, because people hated, you know, Clinton, people hated Trump, but people still voted for them in huge numbers. Even with that, you know, with the huge movement against either of them, because they were, you know, n I've never heard a single person be like, you know what, the problem with 2016 is there were just two great candidates. I couldn't decide between which one I liked more. No, it was, I hated this person, I hated this person very slightly less. And even in, in with that huge uh, surge, the third party candidates of uh, Johnson and Stein, of Libertarian and Green Party respectively, got three and 1%. The interesting thing about this election is it's gonna sh sh just go to show how bad a candidate can get before people will switch over, and they won't. People will not switch it by and large, which is interesting because therefore it might say, you know what? What does it matter if most of the country hates you if you call yourself a democratic socialist? What does it matter if most of the country hates you just because Actually, the interesting thing about uh, Pete Buttigieg is one of his major attack lines. It, it should be the fact that he has butt in his name, but it's actually, it's like, uh, he's, he's like gay and married or whatever, um, which is surprisingly like a big thing for certain parts of America. But like, th the interesting thing is it doesn't matter how big the attack ads on the other person, it really comes down to who people hate least, and that's what will determine this election. That's why people vote for a president they disapprove of in huge numbers. Um, because um, American politics is a really interesting place that is ex it's getting more and more partisan is my point. The long, the, the short term trend doesn't really matter too much in the long run as, as a British person. I think it's going to be potentially bad for us and potentially bad for the world regardless. Um, but I think the interesting thing here is just how partisan the US is getting, just how much uh, is going on right here. So that, yeah, even though once you know the strategy of how it goes down, yeah, it's more interesting, but also kind of kind of sad it's on the way too but that's my thoughts on these things let me know what yours are in the comments i hope you all enjoyed this random political second channel video let me know if you do want to see more of these because i feel like breaking down elections is surprisingly fun i i like it a lot there was an interesting one in ireland while i was in california recently so that was a whole thing um speaking of which actually you know i i want to talk about the politics of california sometime because of how what the the super blue in the, the states right here are so deep in that rabbit hole that like the way their elections work is just so conflict like, it's so different and it's the same with the super red states there's kind of two different americas that are forming more and more separate to each other it's a whole thing it's interesting to me but yeah there's been elections i want to cover them more let me know if you agree with that or if you don't yeah i, d I don't know let me know also uh, more geography of toy cat coming soon but for now thank you for watching second channel don't i do care about you a little bit Unless you live in America. Then you're the worst. Ha ha ha. Except Americans don't get sarcasm, so that's that's a joke. That's what I'm doing right there. Now I'm being mean by saying you don't get sarcasm. So I'll just say goodbye.